Well, the Lord has blessed us in so many ways at Calvary. You've already heard that. And I'm so thankful for the testimonies that have been shared tonight. And uh, one of the ways that God has blessed us, God has given us wonderful, just wonderful workers and wonderful uh, people that have a heart for the Lord. And this morning in our class, we had two young men that uh, taught our class, Brother uh, Timmy and Brother Taylor, and uh, did a great job this morning, great job teaching in the class and uh, just, you know, watching them and uh, seeing the growth in, in their life. Tonight, we're going to hear from two other young men, and, and, uh, and so in just a moment, we're going to have what I call tag team preaching, all right? And each of these men is going to take 15 minutes, and they're going to speak to us this evening, and Brother, Brother Raphael is going to uh, start us uh, out tonight. Uh, I will say this, we've never had any preacher preach to us in an open toe shoe tonight, all right? And, uh, and so... But he gets, he gets a break. He gets a break on that tonight. He had surgery here recently. And, uh, but I'm excited about hearing him preach tonight. So here's what's going to happen. He's going to preach. And then as soon as he gets done, Brother Brandon's going to come straight up, right behind him. And it's just going to be preach, preach, all right? And then we'll come up after that and we'll close up the service tonight. Amen. Get your, hand, your uh, Bibles and hear him well tonight. Come on, preach for us, brother. Amen. Amen. Okay. Amen. Amen. I only got 15 minutes, so... Uh, praise the Lord. If you got your Bibles, turn to James. James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And uh, today, we're going to be, I'm going to be speaking on a double-minded man. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Amen. James chapter 1. We're going to start in verse 2. James chapter 1, verse 2. When you get there, say amen. amen. If you're not there, say oh me. Okay. Amen. Amen. Starting in verse 2, and it says, My brethren, count it all joy when ye fall into diverse temptations, knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that ye may be perfect and entire, wanting nothing. If any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, that giveth to all men liberally, and upbraideth not, and it shall be given him. But let him ask in faith nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea, driven with the wind and tossed. For let not that man think that he shall receive anything of the Lord. Verse 8, a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. Let's pray. The only Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for you this uh, wonderful time, God. Just, Lord, I ask you that you take my, my nerves away. Uh, God, we ask that you just help me speak through me uh, this evening. Uh, God, uh, let us uh, open our hearts, Lord, empty uh, all of us of any sin that would keep us from uh, hearing from you tonight. And God, we just uh, thank you for all you're going to do. We ask these things to pray. Amen. Amen. A lot of times uh, we, we tend to say, well, a double-minded man, we say, oh, you know, that's just modern-day terms. That's a two-faced person. Amen. Everybody knows somebody that's two-faced. Amen. Amen. Hey, hey, look, I didn't see, I didn't told you, I like to communicate, all right? So y'all communicate with me, I can, you know, we keep this thing going, all right? So amen. So everybody does, nobody likes a two-faced person. Somebody that'll smile in your face and then talk junk behind you, behind your back. You know, double-minded people aren't people to be around. People that they sow discord, they, they spread rumors. You know, they, they, they try to say they're your friend. But really, they done stabbed you about six times because they done went and told all your business. You know, it's funny. Well, first, I want to say, I'm going to have to apologize to you guys. Um, naturally, I am a very shy person, naturally. I, that's just who I am. I'm very shy. I keep to myself. Um, I'm dead serious. Y'all are laughing? I'm dead serious. I'm a very shy person. Um, by nature, uh, I, I try to joke. Anytime I crack a joke, it's because I'm getting my nerves out and I'm trying to break ice. Amen. You know, like, pastor's so sharp. Look at that man. That man's sharp, right? That man's so sharp, he can cut a hot plate with a slice of butter. Amen. Y'all get that tomorrow. Praise the Lord. But just imagine me and Brother Brandon or any other person in the church. Pastor, we behind you. We love you. We got your back. Hey, can you believe 
pastor talking about people in the choir got to have standards? You ever heard something like that before? I couldn't believe it. I don't like him. Hey, pastor, I love you. You know, you know that? I just love you so much. You know, that, that's unstable. Because guess what? Now you done tainted this person because of something that you didn't agree with with this man. Now I'm going to apologize again. I don't actually act the way that I normally act around you guys. And um, a lot of times it has to do with my mind and the way I think. Um, Honestly, and this is not a joke, okay? So don't take this any type of way, okay? When I was a kid, I was afraid of white men. That's God honest truth. Because my dad is a Black Panther. He was a part of the Black Panther Association party. And growing up, I used to hear a lot of stories about what white men used to do. And a lot of times, I kind of bottom myself up a little bit because I get up in front of people and then I get afraid because I see, and that's not right. And that's unstable. Because if I love God, if I say that I'm on God's side, then it shouldn't matter. If I say that I'm a Christian, shouldn't matter. You know, I am so hesitant, so hesitant, just because of my mind. And that's me being open. I'm not afraid of white people anymore, okay? I'm just just letting y'all know that, okay? As you can see, (laughs) praise the Lord. But nobody likes a a run and tell that. When when something's supposed to be on the hush-hush, it's supposed to be on the hush-hush. When you're friends with somebody and then you're running and telling their business to somebody else. Churches don't need that. You know, the Bible says, and I'm going to go back to verse 6, it says, But let him ask in faith, not wavering. Faith, nothing wavering, for he that wavereth is like a wave of the sea driven with the wind and tossed. Just imagine being out on a little, little, little boat, a little rowboat, and that wave start tossing. That wind start blowing. Eh, you finna sink. Yeah, you finna. That water start to come and rising and getting in that boat. You trying to throw water out. Well, guess what? You done got caught. That's what a lot of times we, us Christians, we, you know, we get all civilized and think we can't shout amen and stuff. But we get so caught up because we done told one lie to one person. And then we went back and said something else to somebody else. And then we go back and do something with somebody else. But then we say, oh, well, you know, I, I love my people. But then that's not what your mouth say. Some of y'all don't get it. Some of y'all don't get it. You, you, you go around spreading little things about, oh, I didn't like what Pastor said this. Oh, I don't like when Brother Brennan did this in the choir. Oh, I ain't like when, when, when Sister Maddie, you know, she was doing this with the, with the little kids. And I, I didn't like when... Uh, last time I checked, this wasn't a social club. Last time I checked, the Bible says that we're supposed to encourage one another. Yeah. Last time I checked, the Bible says that we ain't supposed to be, you know, uh, we, we call them little things uh, parking lot meetings. You have a meeting, and then there's a meeting, about five of them outside. Oh, sh- here come Pastor. Hey, hey, Pastor, how you doing? Oh, sh- sh- what, what, I mean, you know, you know, where, where your mind at? Is it set on Christ? Is it set on God? Is it set on things above? Or is it set on trying to 
well, I know this and now I know that. And I know if I just, oh, I don't like when they did this, so I'm going to go and run and tell somebody else about it. That's why people don't come to church. That's why people say, I don't go to church because they're a church full of hypocrites. I'm sorry. We can't be that. I'm sorry. That has no place here. When was the last time you went and ran and told something just because you ain't like something? Be honest with yourself. You know, this morning, we, I, I, I spoke to the, to the kids this morning about you can't serve two masters. Either you love the one and hate the other. I'm sorry, but you can't say you love Christ and don't like somebody. You can't say you love Christ and won't talk to people about Christ. You can't say you love God and then you not faithful to church. That you can't say you love Christ, but then you kind of sneaking off and and just doing your own little thing. I told the kids, you know, a, a, a one of those chain link fence. At the, at the top of that fence, they got the little wires that, of the links that hang out, like a little X. And then you got the, the pole of the fence. I asked some kids, I said, how hard would it be to balance on that? They said, oh, that'd be hard, Brother Raph. We, we couldn't balance on that. That's right. So you got to choose a side. You're either going to serve God or you're not. Stop giving Christians a bad name because you want to say, I go to church on Sunday morning. I go to church on Sunday night. But then you down there by the, come on, you down there by the store getting cigarettes and beer. And people say, oh, I thought you went to church. I thought you was a Christian. What happens? What happened? Because you was never stable, you are always double-minded. You was letting sin get a little inch. Come on. Sin to keep you from God. God will keep you from sin. It's that easy. Oh, Brother Raphael, you know, I've been, you know, I've been, I've been doing this for a long time. You know what I'm saying? God is okay with it. I'm sorry you stopped hearing from the Holy Spirit. It's not true. You have not. God is not okay with you sinning. You just then did it so much you became callous. We got too many people in the church, too many people in the church saying they love God. Too many people in the church, where's the action? Where's the thought? Where's the love? Where's the teaching? Where's the hunger to win souls? Where is it? When the last time you told somebody about Christ, come on now, wake up, y'all. When the last time you shared the gospel with somebody, I'm sorry, but if you've been saved, you should be out there telling people about Christ. Well, I've only been saved for a month. And you can use your own testimony to lead somebody. Never seen a generation so just ugh, mediocre. You know why? Because the generation before just let things slide. It's okay. I mean, they, you know, it's all right. It's not. The word of God is too precious. You're either with it or you're against it. You can't serve God and mammon. You can't serve God and yourself. You can't serve God and your flesh. You can't serve God in that job. We got we to we gotta stop making, we got to stop building our schedules, building God around our schedules. We got to start building our schedules around God. That's how that works. We can't say, hey, praise God, I'm raising my hands. I'm lifting them up, but then I got a potty mouth. Come on, y'all, we too old for this. We too old for a, a kid to tell you real quick, oh, no, you ain't supposed to do that. 
If the kid said it, you know good and well you know it. Oh, I ain't know that. Mm. Come on, you, you're unstable. It's time to get back to the Father. It's time to get back to doing the things that, the, the way we're supposed to. It's, it's, it's about time to get back to this Bible. Amen. Don't be double-minded. Don't be the sower of discord. Amen. Amen. Don't be the backstabber. Don't be that. Amen. Be someone who lifts, lifts up the Bible and say, Amen. I follow Christ. I follow God. I'm with my pastor. You know, unless he's doing something he ain't supposed to be doing, then you know what I'm saying. That's something totally different. <laughs> Praise the Lord. But I, I, I got his back. I got the deacon's back. I got the staff back. I got the layman's back. I got the Sunday school teacher back. I got the choir director's back. I got the choir members back. I got the nursery workers back because they need they back. So where you stand tonight? Are you in the fence where it's safe? Or are you on the outside with the wolves? Come on, don't be a sheep. Listen, don't be a wolf in sheep's clothing. Amen. 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 Psalm 23, I want to take your Bibles very quickly here. And ours will complement each other, I promise you. It's amazing how the Lord does this. And I'm going to have to preach very quickly. Amen. Because as you know, I am short-winded. Amen. Amen. I'm going to do my best. And they've already got my clock started. Amen. Psalm 23. Psalm 23. Follow with me. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He maketh me to lie down in green pastures. He leadeth me beside the still waters. He restoreth my soul. He leadeth me in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Thou rod and thy staff, they comfort me. Thou preparest the table before me in the presence of mine enemies. I want you to pay close attention to this latter portion. Here, thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. I want you to pay close attention back up one verse to verse number five in the latter portion. There, David says this after saying, Thou anointest my head with oil, my cup runneth over. I want to preach very quickly here on that. My cup runneth over, my cup runneth over. David, here in the midst of trials and tribulations, we went over that Wednesday. I'm not going to take the time to do all that, but one of the darkest moments of his life, he could stand and say, thou anointest my head with oil and my cup runneth over. And with God, a uh, man, uh, man can anoint a uh, man. And we see that all through the Old Testament as man would come and the prophets would come and they would anoint man with oil and they would anoint them for certain occasions. But David here is talking about God himself. He's not talking about man. He's talking about God. And when he says, thou anointest my head with oil, my my cup runneth over, even in the midst of trials and tribulations in one of the darkest moments of his life, he can still stand and say, my cup runneth over. And he can say that because in whom he put his trust in. He can say that standing in the midst of trials because he put his trust in God. God's protected, protected him in the past, and he continues to protect him as he is now an older man in this psalm. That cup that he's talking about here is not necessarily a physical cup like you and I would put water or sweet tea in. Amen. He's talking about our lives and our, our lives as a whole that are filled all, all, to the brim, to the point of overflowing, to the point where now it is affecting everyone around us. First Peter chapter 1, verse number whom having not seen ye love in whom thou know now you see him not ye yet believing you rejoice with joy unspeakable and full of glory now let me pause and say this I'm gonna give you some low notes here and then I'll pick it up at the end we see here we talk about David and his cup was overflowing and then my mind began to run about this cup and this overflowing of God's goodness and God's mercy that we see in the next verse that's gonna follow him all the days of his life and he knows where he's gonna dwell in. He knows he has the goodness and favor of God, and yet he sees this and this overflowing of his life. I began to think about some cups in my life that I do not want overflowing. There's some cups in my life that I don't want overflowing. Now, David was speaking of this cup, and we want our cups to overflow like David's, but before we get there, I thought about some cups that I don't want to run over. How about this? Number one, the cup of the world. 
I don't want the cup of the world in my life to run over. And we live in a society today that says, do what you want and do what feels good. Nike's slogan is literally, just do it, right? And, and it's broadcast to our children at a young age through media, through social media, and it's advertised everywhere. Do what you want to do. Do what makes you feel great. Whatever it is that you want to do, do it, and you'll feel great, and you'll have a good time doing it. And that's nothing short but a lie from the devil himself. The world will always leave you wanting more. Look at the woman at the well. She time and time again yet was seeking and seeking and seeking after one relationship to another, after another relationship after another, seeking that worldly feeling that she could not get, but yet through Jesus Christ she got all the water that she'll ever need. She will never go back to that well once again. The cup of the world, we don't need that cup to be overflowing in our lives. How about this? And I'm going to have to hasten. How about the cup of material things? Our pastor brought some of this out this morning. The cup, not only the cup of the world, but I don't want a cup that's overflowing with material things. And, and when is enough ever enough? I, I love this. I read this quote, and you've heard this, just one more dollar, right? Just one more dollar. We've heard that statement. Where did it come from? Billionaire John D. Rockefeller was asked that question, when is enough ever enough? And this was his famous response, just one more dollar. Just one more dollar. Just one more dollar. You Listen, you will never serve mammon and God. You'll never serve one or the other, but you'll always be in betwixt. You'll always be in that waging war. So uh, material things can come and go, but yet we don't need that cup to be full in our lives. May I remind you of Ecclesiastes chapter number 5 and verse number 10. He that loveth silver shall not be satisfied with silver, nor he that loveth abundance with increase. This, uh, this is also vanity. And how about this one? right here how about the cup of envy mm. not only the cup of the world not only the cup of material things these are cups I don't want overflowing in my life how about the cup of in me and envy if we'll if we'll take just a moment here and self-examine ourselves uh, uh, of this envy examination of ourselves pause for just a moment when is the have you have you compared your life your home your spouse your kids or even your lawn to your neighbors here in the here in the past couple days it's very easy for us to do that because that's what the world says. You got to have bigger, you got to have better, you got to outdo so and so. Have you ever heard the statement, keeping up with the Joneses? Absolutely, right? It's always that material battle, that, that, that going back and forth. But what that is, that is envy. When we look upon somebody and we envy after them, and that's not good for you and I as Christians. Proverbs chapter number 14 and verse number 30 a, a sound heart is the life of the flesh, but envy is the rottenness of the bones. Psalm 23, verse number one, may I remind you again, David said this The Lord is my shepherd, and I shall not want. You see, David realized some things, and he said this, that, listen, I find my all in all in the Lord. I find my all in all in God. I need nothing else. He will provide for me. He will sustain me, and yet he will lead me and guide me, and surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And you can back up, and that's why his cup was overflowing. Amen. Because he found his all in all in God, not necessarily in seeking all these things. Uh, now God provides what we need when we need it, and that can allow our cup to overflow. And there will always be someone with more, this or that, you fill in the blank. But be content with what the Lord gives you and I today. In Hebrews 13, verse number 5, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as ye have. For he hath said, I will never leave thee nor forsake thee. Now we're on the back half of my time. Hang on. Let's shout it out a little bit. I want my cup overflowing with a few things. And how is my cup overflowing? How can we get to the point where David, even in the midst of trials and tribulation, can say, thou anointest my head with oil. Hey, and my cup runneth over. Hey, how does he say that? Our cup, first of all, runs over because having Christ, we have in him all things. Romans chapter 8, verse 32 reminds us of that, that he that spared not his own son but delivered him up for us all, how shall he not with, not with him also freely give us all things? I love this in Ecclesiastes chapter number 3 and verse number 19. And, know, and to know the love of Christ, and to know the love of Christ, which passes knowledge, that ye might be filled with all fullness of God. God. Again, may I remind you what David said, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. David recognized some things and his cup was overflowing because of that. He found his all in all in God. Our cup, let her be here, our cup runs over uh, when we give to the Lord. 
Our cup runneth over when we give to the Lord. I may I remind you of this, of Malachi chapter 3 and verse number 10. Bring ye all the tithes into the storehouse, that there may be meat in mine house, and prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that, sh that, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. May I take it a step further and say this in Luke chapter number 6 and verse number 38. Give and it shall be given unto you. Good measure, pressed down, and shaken together and running over shall men give into your bosom for, for with the same measure that ye met uh, with all it shall be measured to you again. I'm not preaching a, a wealth and, and, and health prosperity gospel. What I'm saying is there'll never be an, a time when you can outgive God. I'm saying that there'll never be an out, there'll, there'll never come a time in your life when you can outgive God. Time and time again, we've seen him prove himself just within the walls of this church, and you likewise have seen him proven in your life when you didn't have but little to give and knowing that it's right to give to the Lord what is rightly due him, and you give it to him, and now you're short for the month, and the bills are coming in. Hey, my God does a lot in three days, amen, and when the bills are coming in and time is running short, my God stands steps in every time, time and time again, and meets our needs. My cup runneth over when we give to the Lord. May I also say this, not only of your money, but of your time. Oh, yes, because see, when you give somebody part of your time, you've given them a part of your life. You can't get that back. You've invested now in them. Our cup runneth over when we give to the Lord. I lastly hear, and I'm almost done, our cup runneth over when we pray and receive. I said, honey, when we pray and receive. I'm talking about those times when we prayed and prayed and prayed, and then God moves on our behalf, and he answers our prayer, and that's when our cup begins to bubble up, and it overflows, and it affects all those that are around us. May I remind you of John chapter number 16, 24 says this hitherto have you asked nothing in my name ask and you shall receive that your joy may be full Paul Harvey told a story once of a three-year-old boy that went to the grocery store with his mother and now on their upon their arrival they get out of the car and it's but right before she puts him in the buggy this little boy she looked him dead in the eyes as most of us do as parents at our children and we look at them and she says you are not gonna ask me for any child chocolate chip cookies when we get in here. Anybody ever had that conversation with your children? Don't touch nothing. Don't ask me for nothing. We ain't got money for that, all right? Before they even made it into the store, she had this conversation with her three-year-old child. Now he was doing great as they were making their way through the different aisles of the grocery store. The deli section did not bother this young man, and not one bit. The bread aisle, he smelt the sweet bread, but he did not say nothing. But then they rounded the corner to the cookie aisle, and you're right, this this young man, three years old, locked eyes with them chocolate chip cookies. And without hesitation, he didn't make eye contact with his mama. He looked at them cookies and said, Mama, can I have some cookies? And immediately, as the response should have been, I told you no. Before we got in here, I said, no, you cannot have any cookies. Sit down and be quiet. He sat down, and they continued on down through the aisles. They made it through the frozen section there. They went by all the TV dinners. That did not arouse his interest, not one bit. But lo and behold, as the, the journey went, they had to go back through another aisle to pick up something that she had forgotten. And you know which aisle it was? It was the cookie aisle again. The moment he rounded the corner, he he knew which aisle it was on, and he eyed him from a distance, and he stood up in the seat and hollered again, Mama, can I please have some chocolate chip cookies? He said it so politely, she still politely said, No, sit down. I told you we're not getting any chocolate chip cookies. They finish up their shopping now. They're around in the corner, heading to the checkout aisle. This young boy sees the aisle coming up. The line is being formed. He sees where they're going, but he also sees they're getting ready to pass. But one more time, the chocolate chip cookie aisle and as they round the corner he seizes the moment in this moment he stands up and with the voice as loud as he could mu muster he said in Jesus name can I please have some cookies <laughs> astonished 
all those that were around began to whip their heads around and they looked at this young man who is standing up in the child's seat and yelling to the top of his voice, Jesus, may I please have some cookies? And in astonishment, those that were around him looked at him and gawked and looked and it was like, what in the world? And some even applauded at the young man's effort because if you've been in a grocery store, you know you run into the same people time and time again. And some said, yes, he knows what he wants. The story goes that they ended up getting some cookies, but not from the mother. The mother not, did not buy them. But it was the patrons that were around that heard this young man's plea in Jesus' name. Can I please have some cookies? The story goes that they ended up with 23 boxes of cookies. <laughs> Amen. I said all that to say this. Sometimes God answers our prayers exactly. Not always in our time. Maybe not always the way we wanted. He only wanted one cookie. Now they're leaving with 23. Now I'll remind you of this verse here in Ephesians chapter number 3, verses 20 and 21. Now unto him that is able to do exceedingly above, abundantly above all that we ask or think, according to the power that worketh in us, unto him be the glory in the church by Christ Jesus throughout all ages, world without end. Amen. You see, there are some cups that I want overflowing in my life. But there's also some cups I don't want overflowing. Because you see, I, I gave this illustration in the teen class, and I'm done. I mean, have you ever seen somebody stack up a pyramid of glasses, whether it be wine glasses or different types of champagne glasses, and they'll pyramid them up from the bottom, has a wide base, and all the way up to one singular cup on the top. And they would begin to pour whatever liquid they wanted to in that top cup. And then when that top cup got full, what happened? It trickled down to the next set. And when those cups got full, what happened? It trickled down to the neck. And it's a beautiful sight. It looks like a waterfall. Mine would be full of sweet tea, amen. I'm talking about diabetic coma liquid sugar. But listen, as it trickles down from one to the other, can I say this? Let's be careful tonight which cup we let overflow because it will affect those around us. Whether it be good or bad, whatever you let in your life will be a trickle-down effect as that cup overfloweth and affects those around us. If it's good, hallelujah, praise the Lord. But if it's bad, stop where you're at. Get it right with God. Empty the cup and allow him to fill it with something else. Leaders in the church, ministry leaders, watch what cup you're filling up. Watch what cup you're filling up because it will affect those under you that are serving alongside of you. Young people, watch what cup you're filling up because there's little kids looking up to you tonight. Teenagers, you may not realize it or not, but you have little ones that are looking up to you. Adults, you have kids that are looking up to you. Ministry leaders, you have adults that are looking up to you. Watch what cup you're filling up. My cup runneth over. Amen, Amen preacher. Take your Bibles and turn to Joshua chapter 7 tonight, please. Joshua chapter number 7, and uh, originally I had not planned on preaching tonight. I was just going to let these guys uh, preach, and by the way, did a great job, didn't they? That was wonderful. And so let me close us out tonight with about 10 minutes if I can. Uh, Joshua chapter 7, if, if, uh, if you'll just give me just a moment just to challenge the church as we close the service tonight. Joshua 7, and I think that this passage is going to preach itself and so the Bible says in verse 1, But the children of Israel committed a trespass in the accursed thing. For Achan, the son of Carmi, the son of Zabdi, the son of Zerah, of the tribe of Judah, took of the accursed thing, and the anger of the Lord was kindled against the children of Israel. And Joshua sent men from Jericho to Ai, which is beside Beth Haven, on the east side of Bethel, and spake unto them, saying, Go up and, and view the country. And the men went up and viewed Ai. And they returned to Joshua and said unto him, let, let, let not all the people go up, but let about two or 3,000 men go up and smite Ai, and make not all the people to labor thither, for they are, they are but few. So there went up thither the people, about 3,000 men, and they fled before the men of Ai. And the men of Ai smote of them, the Israelites, smote of them about 30 and six men, for they chased them 
from before the gate, even unto Shivarim, and smote them in the going down. Wherefore the hearts of the people melted and became as water. And Joshua rent his clothes and he fell to the earth upon his face before the ark of the Lord until the eventide, he and the elders of Israel, and put dust upon their heads. And Joshua said, Alas, O Lord God, wherefore hast thou uh, at all brought this people over Jordan to deliver us into the hand of the Amorites to destroy us? Would to God we'd been content and dwelt on the other side Jordan. O Lord, what shall I say when Israel turneth their backs before their enemies? For the Canaanites and all the inhabitants of the land shall hear of it and shall environ us round and cut off our name from the earth. And what wilt thou do unto thy great name? And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Israel hath sinned. And they have also transgressed my covenant which I commanded them, for they have taken even of the accursed thing and have also stolen and dis disassembled or dissembled also, and they have put it even among their own stuff. Therefore the children of Israel could not stand before their enemies, but turn their backs before their enemies because they were accursed. Neither will I be with you. Wow, wow. Neither will I be with you anymore except ye destroy the accursed thing or the accursed from among you. Dr. Charles Haddon Spurgeon, the great, great uh, prince of preachers, they called him out there in London, England, Spurgeon Tabernacle, the great Spurgeon Tabernacle. And uh, there was a young man, he was talking to a young preacher one day, a young pastor one day, and the young pastor was discouraged. You could tell he was very discouraged and very distraught. And, and uh, the wise, wise preacher said to the young man, young man, you seem you seem a little discouraged about something. And he said, well, he said, Dr. Spurgeon, I, I am. He said, I really am discouraged. And he said, well, what are you discouraged about? And he said, well, he said, I've been pastoring this church. And he said, it just seems like we're just not having people saved, like we really ought to have, be having people saved. And, and, uh, and I'm just, you know, I'm just discouraged about that. And the wise pastor, the wise preacher, Dr. Spurgeon, said to the young man, he said, young man, he said, do you really, do you really expect to have people saved all the time? And the young preacher said, well, no, sir, I guess I don't all the time. And Dr. Charles Haddon Spurgeon said, young man, that's your problem. You don't expect to have somebody saved every service. And because you don't expect it, you don't receive it. I'm going to be honest with you, church. I, I mean, I'm just testifying to you a little bit here tonight. But uh, I'm thankful for what God is doing at Calvary. God's been so good to us. But if we go through a service, any service, and it might seem like a banner day. It might be a great day. We might have a great crowd just like we did today, just a great. We had a strong crowd, new families, a lot of visitors. And, uh, man, it was exciting. They had a good day in kids' ministry, I understand. And, and, uh, but, but I'm just going to tell you, this is just personal testimony. If we go through a day and we don't have somebody saved, I can guarantee you this, that somewhere you're going to find preacher. And I'm with the Lord, and I'm saying something like this, Lord, was it something in my life? Lord, I, was there something that I did that hindered the Spirit of God today? Lord, was there anything? And, and by the way, I, don't, I never start. I never start with you. I always start with me. Somebody said, it's not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, oh Lord, standing in the need of prayer. And I'll say, Lord, was there anything in my life today that hindered the Spirit of God from working or hindered somebody from making a decision? And, and Lord, reveal it to me. And, and Lord, if there was anything, I want you to forgive me. And then I'll often pray, Lord, if there was anything in the church, if there was anything in the church that might have hindered, Lord, I ask you to forgive the church. Would you notice about this scripture right here, several, several things I noticed. Number one, I noticed it was sin that hindered the blessing of God. Did y'all see that? Look at verse 10 with me, if you will. In Joshua chapter 7, verse number 10, the Bible says, And the Lord said unto Joshua, Get thee up. <laughs> Joshua, get up. What are you doing? What are you doing laying down? Get up. 
Wherefore liest thou thus upon thy face? Look at verse 11. He said, Israel, Israel hath sinned. In other words, the Lord said, uh, uh, Joshua, let me tell you why uh, Israel, who, who just defeated a powerhouse by the name of Jericho, a fortified city, a city that had a wall around it, <laughs> And yet the Bible says that they came against Jericho and the, the walls of Jericho came tumbling down and, and Israel conquers Jericho. It would have been something like Chicago or something like Los Angeles, California in our day and time. And, and then they, they win this great victory against Jericho and they come up against this, this uh, uh, next little city. It's like Mayberry, Mayberry RFD. And they said to Joshua, don't let everybody go up. Man, we'll, we're going to, listen, we just wiped out Jericho. We'll knock these folks off and be home by supper time. And so Joshua said, all right. And they sent about 3,000 people. And the Bible says that maybe our RFD whooped them bad. 36 Israelites lost their life. And in fact, the Bible says they put them to shame that Ai chased the men of Israel. They were embarrassed. They were mocked. They were, uh, listen, they were put down. You know why? Sin. There was sin in the camp. And that sin restrained the blessing of God. I noticed something else. I noticed it was not only sin that hindered the blessing of God. I noticed it was singular sin. Singular sin that hindered the blessing of God. Look at verse 19, if you will. Verse 19. And Joshua said unto Achan, my son, give, give, I pray thee, glory to the Lord God of Israel. and Make confession unto him and tell me now what thou hast done. Hide it not from me. And Achan answered Joshua and said, Indeed, I have sinned against the Lord God of Israel. And thus and thus have I done. When I saw among the spoils a, a goodly Babylonian garment, 200 shekels of silver and a wedge of gold of 50 shekels weight, then I coveted them and took them, and behold, they are hid in the earth in the midst of my tent and the silver under it. Church, listen, did you notice this was not a tribe that sinned? This was not a village that sinned. One man sinned. One man sinned. And because of that one man's sin, the blessing of God was hindered, and Israel lost the battle. You know, people have a tendency sometimes to come to the house of God and they'll say, hey, you know what? What I'm doing is nobody's business because what I'm doing is private and what I'm doing, if it hurts anybody, it's going to hurt me. It's not going to hurt anybody else. Well, that sounds really good, but I'm going to tell you something. That's error. That's wrong. You don't just sin and hurt yourself. When you sin, just like Brother Brandon just said, when you sin, it hurts other people around you. When you're double-minded, it hurts other people around you. And I just, listen, I, 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 I'm still learning so much about this book right here, but if I understand this story in Joshua chapter 7, uh, it at least seems to me that all of Israel was hindered because one man had some prevalent sin in his life and he wasn't willing to get it right. And then I noticed this. It was sin that hindered the blessing of God. It was singular sin that hindered the blessings of God. And I noticed it was sanctification that restored the blessing of God. Look at verse 13 with me. If you will, verse 13, look what Joshua says, or look what the Lord said. Up, sanctify the people, and say, sanctify yourselves against tomorrow. For thus saith the Lord God of Israel, there's an accursed thing in the midst of the old Israel. Thou canst not stand before thine enemies until you take away the accursed thing from among you. Look at chapter 8, verse 1. And the Lord said unto Joshua, Fear not, neither be thou dismayed. Take all the people of war with thee and arise. Go up to Ai. See, I have given unto thy hand the king of Ai and his people and his city and his land. You know what happened when they sanctified themselves? The blessing of God was restored. And God gave victory. Hey, church, listen to me. I'm done tonight. But I want to tell you something. This is big. What's going on at Calvary Baptist Church? It's big. Now, I know we're in Union Grove, North Carolina. I know we're 
We're, we're in the sticks. I get that. I, I, I understand we're in the country. I, and by the way, we're country folk and proud of it. And by the way, nothing wrong with that. But I want you to understand something. What's going on at the Calvary Baptist Church, Union Grove, is big. And we're a part of a work that's not just reaching Union Grove, but we're a part of a church that's reaching harmony. We're a part of, of a church that's reaching statesful. We're a part of a church that's reaching our state. We're a part of a church that's reaching our nation. And what we're doing is big. And I, I do want us to understand something that our just our personal sin can hinder the blessing of God upon a church. You say, preacher, I didn't think it's that big a deal. I mean, nobody knows about it. I haven't told anybody about it. I haven't told you about it. And you know what? Aiken never told anybody about it, but boy, God knew, didn't he? Oh, listen, church, can I just say this? If there's, and, and I want to, when I walk in on Sunday morning, I want to walk in right with God because he deserves that. He's a great Savior. I want to be right with him because Man, he, you're right. He is our all in all. I want to be right with him because I owe it all to him. He saved my soul. The blood's been applied. We heard all that tonight. And, and I want to be right with him because he is my Savior, because he wrote my name in heaven, because I'm not going to go to hell. I, I want to be right with him for that reason. But I want to tell you something. When I walk into the Calvary Baptist Church, I want to be right with him. You know why? Because I know when I come to this place, we're standing between the living and the dead. And if I'm not right with God, anybody hearing me here tonight? If I'm not right with God, if I'm not right with God, and there's lost people in this service, and the Spirit of God is quenched or the Spirit of God is hindered, those lost people may walk out of this church and die and go to hell and you know who the blood's, uh, where the blood's going to be? It's going to be on my hands if I'm not right with God. And so I want to walk in here saying, oh, Lord, nothing between my soul and the Savior. If you're here this evening, if you're here this evening, and there's anything at all tonight that the Holy Spirit could pinpoint in your life, or maybe he's pinpointing it right now, and he's saying, you know I'm talking to you. You know I'm talking to you. If you, could, if you could go out of here tonight and say, Lord, was there anything, was there anything in my life at all that could have hindered the Spirit of God? And before you pray that prayer, you already know. You already know what it is. Then I want you to do something. I want you to listen. Get it right with the Lord tonight. Let's continue to be a soul-saving station at the Calvary Baptist Church of Union Grove. Amen. I'm thankful for the good meetings we have and all that kind of thing and youth meetings and the multiply and all that kind of stuff. But, hey, Calvary, let's keep the main thing the main thing. And the main thing is seeing people born again. And the main thing is seeing people get baptized and become disciples. And uh, God forbid that I do anything that would hinder his blessing. Let's bow our heads tonight. Father, we love you. Thank you for this time we've had together tonight. Thank you for the wonderful word, Father, that you use these younger men to bring this evening. God, help us not to be double-minded in our ways. And Father, help us, Lord, as you fill our cup to overflowing. God, help us to be careful to give you praise and to thank you for, because you're so good. Father, we've watched in almost 34 years, we've watched as you have literally poured your blessings out on the Calvary Baptist Church. Lord, we've watched as the cup has overflowed. People have been saved, baptized, lives have been changed, families have been put back together, marriages have been helped. God, the powers of darkness have been restrained. And God, I pray that until we hear the trumpet sound, I pray that your spirit would continue to to work like that at Calvary and that the lost will continue to come to Jesus, that the Spirit of God will continue to work and God, that there would be a spirit of, of conviction and a spirit of revival and a spirit of repentance, Lord, here at this church. So Father, tonight, forgive us for anything and everything in our life 
that it could even begin to be a hindrance. And Father, I pray that you'd keep your blessing upon this great church and continue to use us. Our heads are bowed tonight. We're going to, listen, it's 736. We're, gonna, we're getting ready to head to the house. Let's all stand around the church tonight, if you will. And if you're here this evening, and if there's anything at all that you need to just tiptoe down to the altar about, it may be nothing that any of these guys preached or I preached, but anything at all that the Spirit of God was dealing with your heart about, or, or maybe tonight some folks just need to come around this altar and say, oh, God, put a hedge of protection around our church. God, put a hedge of protection around my family. God, would you protect my home and my marriage? And God, would you protect my kids? Maybe tonight somebody just needs to slip out and just come and just kneel here at this altar for a moment and just pray about that. I hope you'll come tonight. Father, I pray you'll have your way in this invitation. And Lord, I pray that you'll, you'll help us. Lord, to be the servants that you want us to be. Thank you, Lord, for what we've received today. Now we're accountable for what we've received. Lord, too much is given, much is required. And God, I pray that you'd help us to be so, so careful about our testimony, about our life, about what we're doing. And Father, tonight, we just pray this. We pray you put a hedge of protection around our homes. I pray, Father, you put a hedge of protection around our marriages. God, every couple that's represented here tonight, I pray you'd protect them. Every individual that's here this evening, Heavenly Father, I pray that you'd guard their testimonies. And Lord, I pray that you'd guard the testimony of this church. And Father, I pray that you'd keep us on the firing line. And I pray that many would come to know the Lord because of what's preached and proclaimed at Calvary. Have your way in the invitation. Speak to hearts, I pray. And we thank you, Lord, and praise you, Lord, in Jesus' name. Our heads are bowed, our eyes are closed. Anybody else tonight need to make a move before we go tonight? Anybody else? Lord, help us tonight. Help us. Help us. Keep us where we need to be. Help the main thing to stay the main thing. You can look up this way tonight. Let's sing this chorus, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound. Sing it with me. Amazing Grace. How seat just for a moment if you will hey church we sure love you tonight sure love you and appreciate you and uh, so many of you are busy man you're doing the work for the lord and you're busy in your ministries and you're serving and then some of you are serving in leadership capacities and things like that i want you to understand something you got a bull's on your back tonight and and the, the devil don't play he don't play he plays for keeps he plays for keeps. He don't want to just, listen, he don't want to hurt you. Are you listening to me? He don't want to hurt you. He wants to maim you for life. I'm telling you. That's what a lion does, by the way. He, he rips and tears and mutilates 
And that's exactly what Satan wants to do. And Satan wants to do that at this church. And uh, if we think for half of a second that the, that the devil is happy about what's going on at Calvary, I'm telling you, we got another thing coming. I mean, folks are coming to Christ, and the Lord's, the Lord's growing and uh, growing this thing. And I mean, we had cars parked everywhere. We could park cars this morning. And, I mean, we can't get this parking lot too fast. I mean, it's, we've got cars everywhere, and folks are coming. And uh, young families with young children are coming in. And I can just guarantee you this, Satan's not far away. And he's going to do everything he can to get in every crack and every crevice and to try to mess this thing, this thing up in all Calvary. And we'll be talking about that soon. But I'll, I'm, I'm, and I'm going to tell us how we can make sure that doesn't happen. But let's just make sure. Let's stay close to him. Stay close to the Lord. Stay close to the Lord. And uh, let's just serve Christ and keep our eyes on Jesus. And, and I believe God's got big plans for us. Amen. 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 Glad you're part of the church. Amen. I'm glad I'm part of the church tonight. Amen. The Lord is, the Lord is good. I'm going to let these guys come and give us some announcements, and then we're going to be on our way tonight. evening service, Michael and Haley. Uh, we'll have that walk-through baby shower there for them, so don't forget about that. Our church-wide Christmas decorating on Saturday, November the 30th. All right, watch this time change, 9 a.m., all right? 9 a.m., make sure you put that down. Be here if you can. Like I said, you don't have to give all day, but give as much as you can, and the Lord will bless you for it. Amen? Uh, don't forget about our website. We need everyone to start registering, all right? You need to go in there and get logged in. Like I said, because this is ultimately going to take over the church church app directory, okay? That will eventually phase out unto everything in this one website, all right? So we need you to log in with that, uh, log in, create a login. If you don't have one, if you have any issues with that, see Evan in the back, amen? He'll be glad to help you walk you through everything from that point forward. Let me get these. We got yeah, hey, listen, let me just say this, and we're going to pray. Uh, Tuesday night, we'll have Q&A. And so, uh, we'll, as we said this morning, just bypass the auditorium. We'll see in the fellowship hall. And uh, this will sort of be our Thanksgiving time together. And, uh, and then we won't have service on Wednesday night. And that will give you a little extra time to prepare for your families and things like that. And so anyway, hope you'll be here for, uh, for Q&A. And then Rekindle the Romance. All those going to Rekindle this year, we will meet with you next Sunday. Next Sunday, we'll give you definite details on everything you need to know. And the times and places and addresses and all those important things. And, uh, and so anyway, if you haven't uh, had the opportunity to pay yet, you can go ahead and take care of that at the information desk tonight. That would be a blessing. And then we are doing staff appreciation offering today, and we'll have a couple guys at the doors. And so if you can give a little something toward that, that would be a blessing. Well, we're, we're glad you're here today. It's been a great day today. Let's all stand, if you will, and uh, we'll have Brother Raphael come and dismiss us in a word of prayer. Go away blessed. Amen. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we thank you for this day. Thank you for this wonderful, uh, wonderful uh, day of uh, church. Uh, God, we just ask that you continue to help us to keep our eyes on you. Uh, God, help us every day to put on the, the full armor uh, of God. Uh, God, help us to uh, protect ourselves, guard our hearts. Uh, help us to, to not allow uh, uh, things in our uh, lives that will make us stumble or our families stumble or the people around us stumble. But God, help us to live uh, fully for you. And God, we just thank you uh, for all you're doing. Protect everyone as they go home tonight safely. And we ask these things in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Thank you for joining us today. We consider it an honor to serve you. And our prayer is that the service was a blessing and an encouragement to your life. If you were impacted today by the preaching of God's word, we encourage you to respond. If we can pray with you, or if you would like to make a decision today for Christ, please call us here at 704-327-5662. We have people waiting right now on the lines prepared to help you. Again, thank you for joining us today, and we hope to welcome you again soon. Have a wonderful week.